Thanks for checking out this movie review video. So this is for the 1983 film Mausoleum, and at the moment when I'm recording this, it is available for streaming on the Shutter streaming service. Now, I will say there will be spoilers in this since it's an older film, but a lot of you may not have seen it, so if you haven't, this is a definite recommendation for me. Um, it's one of those movies, though, just so you know, that's so bad it's good. Uh, and I love finding those types of gems, and this is a gem. Uh, the 80s seems like it's that time period that just keeps on giving with these So Bad It's Good films because they were greenlighting pretty much anything, especially when it came to horror movies. And I'm so thankful for that. I know a lot of other people out there are as well. So uh, let's get down to it. Mausoleum, 1983. This was directed by Michael Dugan, who did other films such as Super Seal and Raging Hormones. I don't know. Uh, it was written by Robert Barrick and Robert Madero, who did uh, wrote White Hot, All Tied Up, Camp Utopia, and Battered. That's Robert Madero, not Robert Barrick. He didn't write any other stuff. And Catherine Rosenwink was also involved in the writing of this one. I don't know why they needed so many people to, to write on this script, because it's not like it's good. <laughs> I mean, it's definitely like a terrible script. It, there's a good story idea there, but it's not executed well at all. The dialogue's terrible. Uh, there's a lot of plot holes. It just kind of like meanders, but there's a, there's a good core concept. It's just, they decided not to flesh that out properly and do like a good film. They just decided to do a crappy film, but I'm not complaining. I'm all for it. Uh, this film was one of the ones that actually fell victim to the whole video nasties thing in the UK. So even though it came out in 83, it only actually got a release in 1998 in the UK. So that sucks for them. Uh, but during that time, it actually won a special jury prize at the Paris Film Festival of Sci-Fi and Fantasy. When it originally came out, that is. Not in 1998. Um, so yeah. But uh, yeah. Sorry, I was thinking about something else. Um, the opening credits of this, getting right into it, the opening credits are terrible. Uh, they, they take so long, and it's just showing that graveyard in the background with the credits just gradually, like, coming from the background and up and just continually like this, like, awful. I have not seen credits like that look that bad. And honestly, a lot of the film feels and looks like it's from the 70s and not the 80s. I know the 83 is not super far into the 80s, but there are other movies from 83 and 82 and 81 that look like they're from the 80s. This one looks like it's from the 70s, and this intro credit thing does not help at all <laughs> with that situation. Uh, the smoke in the graveyard looks unbelievably terrible in this, and it looks even worse than your typical 80s effects. Uh, where it's showing like the mausoleum with like that kind of like cut out smoke effect just on the building. Oh my gosh, it's so terrible, but it makes me laugh. And to be honest, there were many times during this film that I laughed because the things were so laughable. Obviously, they weren't intentionally that way, but I'm glad they were that way. Uh, I actually dug the color usage of this. When they go inside the mausoleum, th that itself looked really good. They designed it well, and the coloration was really cool. They had, like, some nice purple in there. They had some nice green. I think they had some blue at one point. Um, so the color usage was really cool. Um, it's not quite Argento-level color usage, but there were things that actually looked good in this film. And to that, um, there was actually good camera work in this film. There were some very inspired-looking camera shots, and I was surprised by that. So it's not that it's a total piece of trash. There are some technical components to it that are pulled off very, very well. It's just, you know, the story, the dialogue, the acting, for that matter, also just not so hot. Uh, why? So why was there a random dude in the beginning down in the mausoleum? I don't understand that. Because um, I guess it didn't really matter, though, because his head ended up exploding. Which I'm glad he was down there, because the head explosion early on is a cool, fun scene. So I'm all for the fact that this dude was randomly down in that mausoleum. But once again, you know, there are plot holes in this. A lot of things that don't make sense. And this is one of those clear things that does not make sense. Uh, I guess maybe he was like a groundskeeper, gardener there. I don't know. But his head exploding was, um, it looked good. Uh, I put down the Nomad family in this one. If nobody saw immediately in this film that Nomad is demon spelled backwards, then you haven't seen Troll 2. So 
Um, no, I'm joking about that. But uh, I picked up on that immediately. I'm sure a lot of people do when they watch this film. It's such a overused thing where the name is something spelled backwards. And it, no one's named Nomad, so it makes you look at it backwards. So they, I think they thought they were being clever, but they were clearly not being very clever. Um, the dialogue and acting is so bad, so bad, but it makes for some really fun and funny moments in this, especially, uh, the guy who plays Ben the Gardener for Susan and Oliver, oh my gosh, his acting so terrible, so weird and creepy at the same time, uh, he might be my favorite character for that reason. Oh, or Elise, I think her name was Elise, the, um, the maid that they had, she was really funny too, uh, actually, I think of a lot of the acting, she was one of the better actresses on the, sh in the movie, uh, but that's not saying a whole lot, because, you know, there wasn't much good acting in this, um, I, ha I like how the reaction to the guy in the burning car in this is to just stare at the fire, I mean, when the car caught on fire because Susan, with her green glowing eyes, which, by the way, the green glowing eyes look cool, when she lights it up, and I, like, I understand the guy's drunk at that point, but him just, like, turning around and just, like, looking at the fire in the backseat of the car, or I think it was in the trunk, and then spread to the backseat of the car, which just it didn't make sense. Like, no one would do that. No one, even if you're drunk, you wouldn't be like, oh, fire. There is no way Susan is so dense that she can't see Ben is a super creeper. Now, there are moments where, like, Susan is Susan, and then there are moments where Susan is possessed by the demon. Now, there are plenty of moments where she's herself, and she's not picking up on the fact that Ben, the gardener, is being a super creeper and wants to get with her. And I, I refuse to believe that she is that dense of a person that she's not picking up on those things. But then things obviously get fun when the demon aspect takes over, and that demon's like, oh this guy's into this chick, uh, let's lure him in and kill him, and that makes for a good time. But that gets to another thing, which is, are demons always so horny? Like, this demon is super horny in this, and I know that's kind of like a way to, like, lure people, but you can just kill him, you know, like, outright. I, I mean, the car situation shows that that could just be done. I guess maybe the demon's just been cooped up so long, just wants to have a good time, I guess that's my assumption. Someone put a comment down there and let me know your thoughts on it. Uh, this movie has some excessively long shots. And that kind of makes me feel like they need to stretch it to a certain runtime. Um, so I could really do out without some of that stuff. Uh, for some people, maybe that adds a little bit to the charm of how bad this film is, but I really would have liked if someone would make a kind of a better cut of this, cutting some of those longer scenes down, because it's not necessary at all. Like, it'll still be a amazingly bad film when you cut that down. Um, I love how needless the montage of Ben working is. <laughs> That's so funny. He's very good at incessantly whacking at a stump I wrote down, because... He's just swinging this axe at this stump, not getting barely anywhere. He does it for a long time, then goes off and does other things like reading and sleeping and doing a little bit of other work. But then he goes back to the stump and he's just whacking at it again. And it's like, what is he trying to accomplish? You get the idea that this gardener is just there to hang out. Like he's just stretching the work out and just when they when Oliver and Susan come home, it's like, oh, you didn't get that much done. And he's like, oh, well, it just ended up taking a lot longer than I than I expected. That's just what it seems like to me. Um, the music they play when Elsie, uh, that's the maid's name, uh, the music they play when Elsie freaks out is so weird and so against trying to convey horror in a horrific moment when she goes up and sees, like, the green smoke coming out of the bedroom. That music, it's like almost like Benny Hill-type music. Like, it doesn't match at all, and it's like, what were they thinking when they put this music to those scenes? Like, it's it's baffling. And it only happens at that point of the film, and I'm just like, I don't get this. But that goes with part of the charm of how bad this is, to be honest. Uh, the hypnosis freakout is a lot of fun, and it reminded me a little bit of, like, a Nicolas Cage-type freakout. Not quite as good, but it, it, you know, was getting there. When Susan's being hypnotized by the doctor, Dr. Andrews, I believe, and she just starts flipping out, uh, that was fun and funny, and I dig that moment. Maybe one of my favorite moments, probably. Um, can Dr. Andrews open his eyes all the way, was one of my questions. 
Um, the moment where he was talking to Dr. Roney on the phone after he, you know, gleaned that Susan's a problem, um, he's talking to her and the whole time he's like this. Like, if you watch that scene and you, like, really pay attention, like, he doesn't open his eyes very far at all. He's, like, squinting the entire time. I don't know if he was trying to read, like, cards uh, behind the camera that someone was holding up with his lines. I don't know. Uh, it was weird. Oliver doesn't seem concerned enough about the large amount of blood splatter on the phone. That was another funny thing to me. When uh, the guy showed up to to deliver some plants for gardening, and she's like, oh, you have the wrong place, but you should come in and call your supervisor and tell him it's the wrong place. Uh, then she kills him with her, her demon green eyes, and then the blood splatters all over the phone. Well, when Oliver comes in, he finds it, and he's just like, oh, honey, are you okay? That was a lot of blood splatter. He should have been panicking when he saw that been like was there a home invasion uh did she cut herself terribly is she dead like he's just so nonchalant he's just like oh honey are you okay you know, i see all this blood here <sighs> crazy uh showing susan just walking around the mall unnecessary the part where they're kind they're talking about her i understand like showing her but like they showed her a lot they kept cutting to her uh, because it's when Oliver and Dr. Andrews are talking. Um, I think that's who, yeah, it's them. And they just keep showing her just walking around the mall. Like, I like the mall scene ultimately, and I'll talk about that in a second, but just showing her continually just walking around the mall is like unbelievably pointless, terrible. Uh, the falling death of the dude from the gallery was amazing. The whole scene with the gallery is funny in itself. Uh, she's just like, I want this you know, piece of artwork, and he's like, oh, it's not available. Well, here's the thing. If it's not available, why is it sitting there on an easel in the front of the store? That doesn't make any sense. The guy, But the guy playing that gallery dude was really funny the way he did his acting, especially when he was yelling after Susan after she stole the painting. Uh, but then his death, his falling death was great. Uh, loved it, especially when they showed the aftermath of it with that piece of artwork through his stomach and out his back. Um, pretty awesome. And that's the thing about this. The practical effects are pretty solid. It's just it's just not a good movie. But like I said, I love that. Uh, I like how Oliver points to Susan getting the painting as a clear indicator that there's something wrong with her. Like, he uses the fact that, look at the painting you got. Like, and he thinks she bought it at that point. But, like, he uses that as an indicator of, like, her taste in a painting that, like, there's something mentally wrong with her. Like... This is what I'm talking about, about the writing. Like, the writing's bad. You should be pointing to something else, definitely. And there's a lot of just, like, doesn't seem believable at all. Like, I know it's a possession story, and that's not necessarily believable in the first place, but you have to create a realistic feeling within the world you're creating, and a lot of what the characters do, how they act, what they say, it does not convey that at all. Um... How are there so many bodies on the spider, or so many thick spider webs on the bodies that are in that weird room in the in the uh, nomad house? That's what I don't understand. The people she literally just killed, I assume it's that same week or day, even like they're totally covered in thick spider webs. That makes no sense. That's just another one of these things of like major plot hole. But you know, it's just charming. Um, the portion of Susan changing at the end is unbelievably excessive. That's another one of those scenes that really just needs to be cut down because it's not even like funny enjoyable at that point. It's just annoying and kind of hard to look at because it's like two image over two images overlaid, like one image on top of another image and you can't even fully see what's going on. Uh, it kind of was really messing with my eyes and there's this really annoying noise that's being done the whole time. Um, funny thing, just side note, when I see all the rats in the mausoleum, I don't really think that like, oh my God, rats, it's so dirty or it's scary. I think those things are really cute. Like I legitimately think rats are cute. I think all rodents are cute, to be honest. I had mice in my house at one point and I was just like, oh, they're so cute when I caught them and released them elsewhere. But, um, uh, that's just me. But the other thing is like the rats are never doing anything menacing in this. They're just hanging out and eating and just being there. So, <laughs> you know, they're not conveying what they wanted them to convey, at least not for me. Uh, and then the very end of this, uh, I wrote, how the hell is Ben the gardener in the graveyard? I guess we're to assume that he's now some sort of graveyard uh, attendant uh, keeper. I don't know. Um, 
But that's another one of those plot hole things. Like, how is that possible? He was just a normal dude, and then he got killed. There's no indicator that he's, like, now possessed by a demon or whatever. But maybe they threw that in there to be like, well, maybe he could be possessed. Maybe there could be something else to this guy. Uh, we could leave that there at the end to be, like, a potential sequel lead-in. Um, which, to be honest, I would love to see a sequel. Let's do this. Let's do this now. Um, this is actually a type of possession film I can get behind. Typically, I don't like possession movies like at all, but there are ones here and there that I'm that I'm good with. And one of the one done like this, where it's so weird and it's so bad that that it's funny, um, I could definitely get behind that type of possession film. So I'm all for it. I love it. And like I said, like even the, the base concept of this is actually a solid concept with the idea of a demon being passed down in the family to the firstborn female of each generation. Like, that's cool. Like, that's a good concept. It's just, you know, it's a crappy movie. It's like they didn't use the concept to make a good film, but I'm thankful that that's what happened. Um so there's a main idea in this as well that's kind of been used a lot in horror and that's kind of the idea of do you truly know the inner person that you're in a relationship with and the fears of what happens if the person you think you know isn't that person and that's been done in horror so many so many times and it's done here and it's done super on the nose in this which you know you expect for a film like this but um yeah I mean just wanted to point that out real quick but in the end, this is one of those films that you watch it, and even while you're watching it, you, you're texting your friends just being like, look, if you have Shudder, you have got to watch this movie. Um, this is one of those ones that kind of goes like socially viral, where you're just kind of like, you just spread it to another person, and then they spread it to someone else, and it just keeps going and going and going, and it gets like a cult status. So I think we should get this going. Let's definitely get it going with Mausoleum. Um, while I was watching it, I texted my buddy Rich and I, cause I know he has shutter and I was like, dude, you need to watch Mausoleum. This movie is terrible, but it's so much fun because it's so terrible. Um, I believe this is a vinegar syndrome film, by the way, too. Uh, it's, I think it has a blue, a kind of recent Blu-ray release on vinegar syndrome. So if you want to purchase it, which I feel like it's going on my list for that. Um, I think it should be available on vinegar syndrome's website, but anyway, I have to rate this twice basically because this is how i do it since it's so bad it's good so as an actual like film film in the whole pantheon of films uh out of five stars i'm gonna give it a one star rating it is not a good film at all even though it gets to the one because of you know the camera work actually being pretty good and the base concept but um what do i give it as far as a so bad it's good film out of five stars i'm gonna give it a solid three and a half stars for so bad it's good it's not quite a four or anything but three and a half i definitely recommend this if you're into bad movies like this is a must in my opinion so anyway thanks everyone for checking this out uh put some comments down there about your thoughts about this we'll geek out about it but do me a quick favor hit that subscribe button if you like any videos i do this one or any other ones that's your best way to repay me and it's totally painless literally takes you a second and it means a lot for my channel because i'm trying to grow um, and if you are going to subscribe or you're already subscribed, make sure you hit the notification bell because that way you know when I have new videos going up or also when I'm live streaming because we talk about some fun stuff when we live stream. Um, always a great time. But thank you everyone for checking this out and until next time, keep it brutal.